Tonight we are at step three, in which we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to care of God as we understood him. And as we begin the, the steps, we said that we were going to do three things with the steps, and tonight we're coming to the main purpose of the big book. The main purpose of the steps is to show us how to recover. And this is built on the foundation of the first two steps. As we begin, and we laid in the first two steps, which is the foundation for the recovery program. Tonight, as we begin step three, we begin the recovery program. Steps three through 12 are actually are the recovery process built on the first two steps. And as we begin the first step, we said the first step has showed us what is the problem. And we found out this was the foundation of the second step. And, and in this step we found we made a diagnosis and we found out what, uh, what was our problem. We said our problem was twofold. We had a physical problem and we had a mental problem. We had a physical allergy to alcohol. An abnormal reaction to alcohol. And according to Dr. Silkworth, Dr. Silkworth says that what is abnormal about our, our, our drinking, we are abnormal drinkers. So once we take a drink of alcohol, we experience a craving that is beyond our mental control. And he said this never occurs in the average tempered drinker. And he went on to say there's no, no way medical science has ever been able to treat this allergy to alcohol. But if we never take the first drink, we will never experience this craving of alcohol. So the only thing is he says entire abstinence. Now if that was the only thing that was our problem, and the doctor said the main problem of the alcoholic sin is in his mind rather than his body. You know, we alcoholics, the fact that we can't drink, he said that would be academic. <laughs> really. If we didn't take the first drink anyway. And that's, that's real simple. <clears throat> so the main problem is this, uh, is this obsession of the mind. This obsession, this idea that allows us to take this first drink. This is the, this is the crux of the problem, my books. This is right where the point of the problem is. If we never did that, that we would never take the first drink, we would never set off the allergy of the body. So he says over here we become restless and irritable and discontent. And we alcoholics do. We become a lot of things when we don't drink. We get lonely, we get full of fears, and we get full of self-pity. Uh, we don't fit in and we don't feel good. And in one of those periods of times while we're feeling that way, our mind remembers. God, I love that. While having this pain, our mind remembers the sense of ease and comfort that would come at once by taking a few drinks of alcohol. And we remember that and we, and we probably say to ourselves, oh, I can't drink because you know what I did the last time. And then our mind said, but look how bad you feel. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, you know, it goes away and, then, and we said, I'm not going to drink this time. My mind, the mind comes and it comes back stronger. And finally, this makes us, this obsession makes us reach over and take a few drinks of alcohol. And once we put the alcohol into our system, the phenomenon of craving begins and we go through the well-known spree. We emerge off with a firm resolution not to drink again. The doctor said this is repeated over and over again. The mind triggering the body and the body in reverse triggering the mind. Unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is little hope for his recovery. He leaves the body and goes to the mind. So we see that the problem is because of the physical allergy, we can't drink alcohol safely. Because of the mental obsession, we can't quit drinking. So these two things make us powerless over alcohol. Powerless over alcohol in that one area. Now it's obvious if if we have this, this dual problem, a physical allergy and a mental obsession that of the two, since there's no way to treat the allergy, the solution must lie within the mind. And 
the second step, the solution to this problem can be determined by looking at the first step. You know, if the problem is powerless, the solution would have to be power. And since this power can't work in the body, it would have to work in the mind. Therefore, I came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. If a power greater than ourselves could re remove this obsession, uh, we could easily control our desire for alcohol. The psychic change. So the second step talks about a possible solution, and we fed to this power last week as we talked about the second. There's power that lies in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the, and the fellowship is a support group. It's very therapeutic for the person who is in the grips of alcoholism to associate with other people who have recovered. And in this fellowship, he will find some strength and some, some support. But then he says the real recovery is in the vital spiritual experience which produces a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. So if we have, have these first two steps, the foundation of far recovery, then uh, we have done, laid the foundation for recovery, or how do we find that power? And that's what we come to the main purpose of our book, how it works, into action and working with others. These chapters contain the 10-step plan of recovery. And he says, you know, the, if we have these, we can now make a decision. And a decision means to, to gather facts. And if you have the first, taken the first two steps as the book outlines this point, then you have fact one, that you are powerless. And fact two, that there is a power and you have a decision. The decision means to choose a fact, or to act, choose one of the facts to act upon or choose a course of action based on fact. And it says we stand at the turning point, turning point. You know, I, I, I didn't quite understand this when I, I had a lot of problems with this step when I come to this, like every new person in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and it says we, uh, I, did, I read it kind of fast, it said we made a decision to turn our will and our life to care of God, and I heard it say, turn your will and your life to care to God. And I didn't like that too well. Didn't know much about God, but I had, uh, heard a, I got somewhere in a minister somewhere in the church that God had us in his hand and I know how I had been performing and I figured he was just going to look down any minute and see me and zap me <laughs> <laughs> but I had a lot of problems with that turning my life over to God see I misread it I didn't say it didn't say made a decision I said it said turn your life over to God and um, I, I was real, real hung up on that in fact, I had a, I always had a great problem with that in the early days of this program. I figured if I turned my, I always was worried about if I turned my will and my life will care of God, he was going to put me in the Salvation Army Band. That was one of my big fears. So <laughs> I, I don't know, everybody else has this problem, but I just knew he was going to put me in the Salvation Army Band. And uh, I've since, uh, I've been real interested in those bands. If I see them different places across the country, I'm always interested in the Salvation Army band. And, and I've never seen a black guy in one of those bands, so I don't guess. <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't really our kind of music, I don't guess. <laughs> but I could just see myself in there playing Rock of Ages, you know. I could, that was. <laughs> but as we approach this step, and really, the step, each step is, is based on the information in the preceding steps. See, the way we've seen that was power was our answer was in powerless in the first step. So the step, step three is based on, step three is based on the first two steps. It's basically, it says, you know, over and over, you know, uh, we have two alternatives to continue as we are insanity or death 
our life on a spiritual basis. You know, the alcoholic has two choices. If you are an alcoholic, there are two choices. You suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. And we stand at this turning point. I and mean, each and every one of us has a decision. And this is what this book is all about. It is uh, really the next proposition then is how do we find that power? If we're powerless and this is power, then the next set of instructions is how to find that power. And, and we begin to find this power just like we do anything else. Everything begins in our lives with a decision. Decision is a focal point uh, of everything that happens to us, we make a decision on it. You know, I used to think that we didn't, but uh, we do. Everything that ever happened in my life, I decided to let it happen. Somewhere or another, it was based on one of my decisions. I thought things just happened accidentally, but I was involved with them. So it's our, our life is full of decisions, and successful living or a failure, failure or success, either one, are based on decisions. See, if we, if we fail, we made a decision to fail. You know? Every time I drank, I made a decision to drink. And once we, we learn that, that uh, it, no, matter, it's no matter what we do today, that if you, what you did to make a living, whether you were a salesman, or whether you were a mechanic, or a painter, or a plumber, or a dressmaker, or, or a secretary, or worked in a laboratory, or if you were a farmer, every, your whole, your, everything that you did today was based on some decisions. Yeah. The success of our days was based on decisions. It was based on gathering facts and choosing a course of action. So decision making is a part of, of human life. And, and the best way to, to make a decision is first to gather the facts. You have to have the right information. So we can't make a decision based on one fact. Sometimes you go down town and, and you're going to buy something. Um, and uh, you know, you go in the store and you look at those things and on the racks. And as soon as you get a couple of them off, you know, you need to make a decision if you're going to buy one. If you're going to buy one, you have to make a decision. Unless you're going to just go in there and buy all of them. Some people don't like to make decisions, so they just say, give me all of them. <laughs> but number one, once we gather these facts, we have to choose a course of action. And when I say we stand at a turning point tonight, if we have these two facts, everyone here, everyone everywhere is going to make a decision. You know? You know, it was not going to be a slip. No one's going to make a mistake. Whatever happens to us, if we go back to step one, or if we go to step two, either way, we're going to have to make a decision. We're going to have to make a decision. Now, as we, he said that this is the beginning, and this is the beginning. The beginning of anything is based on this decision. And of course, you know, the decision involves, it tells us exactly what, what this decision, if we, if we decide to find this power, then there are certain things we're going to give up. There's a certain price we have to pay for everything. And this decision, it says, we, we dis, in, this decision involves turning over our will and our lives. And you know, this is a, a pretty tough issue. You know, for in order for the alcoholic to recover from alcoholism, he's got to up, give up two of the greatest things that's the nearest and dearest to him. First thing, he's got to give up booze. And the next thing, he's got to give up self-will. These are the, you know, it really costs you something to get sober. The two greatest, closest things to his life. So, but we're just going to make this decision, and this is the price that we're going to have to pay. And we stand at the turning point, and we got two alternatives. You know, you know really, uh, this program is nice in the way it does this. It gives you step one, and then it gives you step two, and then it says, 
Well, you can choose which one you want. So that's just about like going, having a bad toothache, you know. Um, you, you don't, you gotta go to the dentist. You don't have too much choice. You know, you don't like to go to the dentist, but when the tooth gets hurting, you have to choose between the dentist and the toothache. And that ain't much of a choice. So, we stand at the turning point and we choose, and our decision is based on these two things. And I think this is one thing that is very difficult for us to understand, is, is this thing called self, or this thing called will. You know, we, we people, he says, we alcoholics are, are self-will run right. So, no, there's anything wrong with self-will, let's just get this straight. Self-will is God-given. It's a covenant with man. You know, God, uh, when God created this earth, he gave man, he said, you are the highest form of life, and I'm going to give you ability of self-directions. I'm going to give you ability to think and reason, and, and you actually have the capacity, uh, because I want you to take the be dominant over the rest of the animals and control the world. So I'm going to give you these things. But he also, you know, he says if, and if sometime in doing your life or sometime in your life experiences that this causes you problems, I will. You can turn it back over to me. But it's a covenant I have given it to you and you can do what you want to do with it. And that's man's greatest blessing from God, or could we say curse, whichever way we look at it. You know, we look at the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. They are all God-directed animals, totally. You know, they, they don't have this ability to reason, they don't have the ability to think, they, they really can't do what they want to do. I, I look at a bird sometimes as it's flying through the air and it turns, and I realize it's so beautiful, but it is God-directed. You know, we, we, we see the birds that can fly from here to South America, uh, 1,000, 6,000, 7,000 miles away, and stay there for a few months and turn around and fly back here. And they are, they are dumb animals. But they, they have a way that they can be God-directed. We just wondered how they can do that. See, but you, there's no way that you could get 5,000 men to do that. Because each of those men has his own intelligence and reasoning. Each of them have self-will. Before they got to Benton, they'd be arguing with each other. <laughs> this ain't the damn way. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they wouldn't get 20 miles down the road. Then self would be, each one of them, you know, would break up the whole thing. But these birds don't have that. They are dumb animals. So God gave us self-will. And self-will is necessary and useful in the human life. But our book says that no, no man will ever be successful off of, totally off of self-will. No man, not alcoholics or anybody else. You know, we are trying to be a self-directed person in a God-directed world. This is a God-directed world, regardless of what we say. So how do we want out? we got a price to pay. So we make a decision to this, 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 this covenant that God, God gave us self-will. We have run it in the ground. Or we own alcohol. We own drugs. We in trouble with our lives. What is the price out? You know, the price out is to give that up. You know, that self-directed. Really, the worst thing... In, the things that have been the most damaging to our lives, we're asked to give up for the things that success. You know, but God uh, gave us this self-will back in the beginning of time. And we go back to will. And, and will is, uh, is our, our inner directions, our, our thinking. We have self-thinking. See, alcoholic, other people... They always talk about right and wrong. That's not the alcoholic's problem. Most, most people have right and wrong. But the alcoholic has got three things. <laughs> He's got right and wrong 
And in the middle, the biggie is what I want to do. <laughs> See, that's what kills him. <laughs> He's always doing what I want to do. See, self. And once he gets that out of the way, then right and wrong won't be no, he can handle that. <laughs> but the biggie for an alcoholic is what I want to do, and that wrong overruns everything. We've got to get rid of that. So, this is what this decision is all about. So it's our thinking. My will, you know, when a person dies, he leaves a will. And that's just his thinking of what he wants done with his money. He writes it down in a, uh, uh, on a piece of paper and gives it to the family. The family rushes him out to the graveyard and bring, comes back home and gets that piece of paper out. It says, last will. And that's his directions. That's his thinking. That's his thinking when he's alive of what he wants to do with his possession. So that's the same thing it means here, our thinking. And it says, in our lives, in our lives is simply my life tonight and your life today is simply a sum total of the actions we have taken. So our lives is our actions. So we make a decision to turn our thinking and our actions. These are the two specific things. These are the things that, that are causing it. This is the root of our troubles. And you know, this all began back in the beginning of time was as God made all, you know, he did, they say he put this thing together pretty good in a few days. And he decided he wanted some folks on here, so he made man, and he made, made man, then he decided that wasn't good enough and made a woman. So, I guess that's when the trouble started, but. <laughs> they, they were all, you know, this was all brand new ball game, see? Brand new creation, brand new world. There wasn't any pollution or anything yet, and no great social problems, and it was just peaceful. You know, what I mean? you know we talk about the garden. I call it Syringe Park. It was just much like a big AA meeting, you know, just, just nice. You know. <laughs> no resentments. Just everybody having a good time. <laughs> and here's Adam and Eve in Syringe Park. And all the other animals as God directed, and there wasn't any other folks around but them. See? And not any other people around, I'm sure that they kind of fit in with the other animals. And since God directed these other animals, Adam and Eve became a part of that, kind of let God direct them. And fit in, and they, God cared for them. He fed them, directed them, controlled them. They had no problems whatsoever. It was, it was the best it's ever been here. And the little old snake come along one day and he said, hey Eve, you, you got self-will. He said, what's that? He said, you're different from us. He said, you're a man and woman. So y'all have self-will. Y'all y'all are the highest form of animals. Y'all don't have to be doing like us. He said, y'all can do what y'all want to do. He said, we can. He said, yeah. I said, there's that alpha. Why don't you eat? He said, God said we couldn't eat. I told you, you could do what you want to do. We can't. So, Adam, so she went over and told Adam, and they ate the apple. God come by, and I guess he was shocked. It was the first time this ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, who ate the apple? And a Adam said, uh, we, we did. So how come you do that, Adam? He said, he was the first alcoholic because he said, she made me do it. <laughs> you know, I believe Eve was the first compulsive overeater too, you know. Because... <laughs> and from then on, you know, they expressed this thing. But we do have <clears throat> self-will. You know, and one of the most beautiful things, and I hope that, that, that everyone, and I think that I've ever read of all the workings of, on Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the most fascinating things that I've ever read and been able to digest is 
at step four and 12 and 12, if you could see in the beauty that Bill describes self. He describes self there in a few short pages like nothing I have ever been able to, to see anywhere. What is self? What is self will in man? He said, God gave man certain social instincts. You know, we have a, we have a feeling of companionship. You know, every, that's a natural thing that we all have. We need that. Why? Because we can't, we can't do anything without each other. You know, man has to have other men and other women too to do anything. We do very few things on our own. We might say tonight, you know, that we fed ourselves, but we really didn't feed ourselves. You know, it took many, many people to grow the food and truck drivers to haul it, people in the grocery store to help us be able to eat tonight. That we don't do really anything on the face of this earth without other people. In fact, over the street house one morning, we went down the table and picked our minds and what could a man do? We do it constantly, almost every group, and try to figure out who can figure out what can a man can do by himself. And we come up, you know, you can't dress yourself because somebody else makes the clothes. You can't go to the bathroom by yourself, really. Somebody put the water up there and the plumbing up there and the paper up there. <laughs> you really can't, we figured out as well, one thing that you can do by yourself is not very attractive. You can die by yourself. And then some folks going to have to haul you off, so really. I don't know. <laughs> Everything else, it takes companions. So this is our survival instincts. These are, these are God-given. They gave, God wanted man to survive, so he placed in us these instincts. And part of these social instincts make up a thing called self. He gave us a, another part of our instinct is our security instinct. We all have a feeling of, if we didn't harvest food, he says, or construct shelter, there would be no survival. And there's a feeling within each and every one of us of security. And, and this enables, this is our survival instincts. Emotional and material security. And this is what makes the world go around today. Everybody out there has went to work this morning. And, and as one person goes to work, the garbage man went to work, the plumber went to work, the doctor went to work, the lawyer went to work, the fireman went to work. All these people had to go to work to make this whole thing work. And they didn't go to work this morning because they like to go to work. They went to security sent them to work this morning. <laughs> you know, need more, as we used to say. That's what makes us work. So security is a part of self. And then he says, you know, there's one other area, our, our sex instincts. If, if, if it wasn't for sex, the man wouldn't reproduce. If we wouldn't reproduce, there would be no survival of the human race. So our social instincts that we have to bring us together, our security instincts that makes us, gives us a drive to, to fulfill those, and our sex instincts, all these things together make up a thing called self. And this is the foundation of a human life. So these instincts were placed in man you know, the companionship, the social instincts, the security instincts, and the sex instincts were placed in us to produce our society. And all together, these, these, these group of instincts make up a thing called self. Self, we're the only animals that have this, comp this set of instincts. And it's called self-will. And as we satisfy these things, they do produce our society. But Bill says also, the, when these things get out of control, instead of them being the instincts that make life, they become a self-destructive process. Self is the root of all human problems. You know, the things we talked about earlier, the social instincts, you know, uh, the, the, the security instincts, the sex instincts. Every person is in problems and is in, and has a problem in his life tonight, and there are a lot of people with a lot of problems, not only alcoholics. People in prisons, people in penitentiaries. Every person is in trouble as a result of one of those instincts out of control. You know, was it, did, he, did he steal because of trying to satisfy his companion instinct? Trying to, uh, 
Or was he trying to build his self-esteem? Is that reading he stole? Did he steal for material security? Or did he steal because of sex? One part of self caused him to do that. Self is the root of all human problems. So this is what we are. We make this decision. Now we're not going to get rid of this thing. Uh, you know, only, only God's will. There are two wills on the face of this earth. The will of man and the will of God. And so we make the decision here. To turn this thing, to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand it. And if self-will is, only God, if self-will is God made, then only God can correct self-will. Our book says we can never correct self-will with self-will. You know, that was my problem. I was always going to make me good. <laughs> and I could never get the job done. It's like we say, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire, is to use self-will on a self-will problem. So w w w here we make a decision. And this is but a decision. Yeah. We don't turn it over here. We make a decision to. We'll make a decision to turn this. Who do we tell us what to do? Make a decision. It tells us what to turn over. Our will in our lives, and we said that was our thinking and our actions. It tells us which specific items to turn over. And it tells us who to turn them over to. Step three is a very simple, precise step. It tells us what to do, make a decision to turn over, which two items to turn over, and who we're going to turn them over to. A God of our understanding. And if we, you know, if we could follow this simple direction, this uh, this step is so simple. It didn't say turn them over to God. It said a God of our understanding. It said deep down every man, woman, child is a fundamental conception of God. It's been there all our lives. And this is the only way that we can understand God. It's through our understanding of God. You know, and I look at uh, uh, God as uh, just like going out here to Razorback Stadium to a football game and they got... 55,000 people in there. And we're all sitting around that stadium. And the, the amazing thing of it, if we really look at it, no two of us see the same thing. Because in that total arena, each and every one of us has a different angle, even than the one that's right next to, right next to us. So nobody sees the game through but, but through my eyes. Nobody sees God through my eyes. We only see God in a, through our lives, through our footsteps. Every person on the face of this earth is, no one has ever walked in my footsteps. So I think, you know, this is, a, I've seen many great expressions of this. And one of my favorite is David who had said, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, I, I had a lot of, I, for many years I couldn't understand where he was coming from. But I had to realize that this, this, this man as a child had worked as a shepherd. You know, this was his work. And this was his conception of God. God as he understood him. He said, uh, I see God as us. The Lord is my shepherd, he said. You know. And remember, he had worked as a shepherd. He said, I shall not want. And David remembered when he was a, a shepherd, he would feed, the, he, would, he would graze the sheep during the day. And as these sheep grazed, it was the shepherd's responsibility to select the pasture for the next day. While the sheep was grazing, the shepherds would survey the pastures for the next day. And the sheep would say, I shall not want. No, the sheep never did say, hey, where are we going to eat tomorrow? They didn't make him know that. That was the shepherd's job, wasn't it? And he said, he'd make him to lie down in green valleys. And they would make the sheep come in and lay down. They would get them down and the sheep would... He would eat the whole time he stood up. And when they make the sheep lay down, they would chew their cuds. They wouldn't eat anymore, and they would chew their cuds. And they would digest the grass in their stomachs. And after they digested the grass, then the, the shepherds would get them up and lead them over to still water. The shepherds would have to dam up the brooks because the sheep, by nature, as he is covered with wool, he's very afraid of water. And he will only drink out of still water. So the shepherds would have to prepare these brooks. 
And he talked about this power. He, David saw God as an all-caring force that cared for the sheep because he had worked as this. This was his conception of God. Now the guy that saw him, uh, he said, he is the captain of my ship. He was a sailor. Now each and every one of us has a conception of God from our own lifestyle or from our own experience or from the footsteps we walk in. And this is the only way we're going to ever understand God. And our book says this is a conception, God, as we understand it. We don't we make a decision to turn him over to that God of our understanding. And then when he talks about it, he says, this is, a, this is the beginning. This is the beginning. This decision is the beginning of recovery, of the recovery process. He says, this is a turning point. And only we as individuals can have this decision, and we will all, as long as we're alive, we'll have this decision. We, we, we can make a decision to run the show, continue to run the show. We can do that. Come because it's a God-given thing. You know, we, you know, they don't even put a man in the penitentiary for self-will. They put him in there for what self-will causes. <laughs> they can't take it away from him. When he gets out, he can exercise the same thing. And this is what we do in our lives. So this is, you know, this is the root of all human problems. So we make this decision. And of course, I, you know, the whole process of these steps is how to find this power. And our book says that this is the beginning. And it says sometimes a great effect is felt, but in most cases it's not. The third step is just a decision to do something. And we don't turn our will over in the life of the care of God in step three. We make a decision to do it. And decision implies further actions. And step three is just a beginning. He says sometimes uh, sometime we get an effect in the case of the sudden spiritual experience. But in most cases, this gonna be, it's going to be a gradual change over a period of time. So we just made a decision. And I think, you know, as, as we look back on this decision, uh, it's going to talk about carrying out this decision. You know, we don't, we just make a decision to turn our will and our life over care of God. The process of really doing this comes through step four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and even ten. These are the steps, actually, that clear away the things that block us from this decision. You know, there are certain things within us that block us from God. Step three is just a decision to turn our will and our life over care of God. And what we have to do is remove the things that block us from God because God is within man. You know, it didn't say uh, uh, we had to, f people say around there, you know, you got to find God. Well, God ain't lost. He's been here a long time. And if you've been here long, long you can't get lost. I hear him tell about the story, and I love this story. I tell it a lot about, you know, God, when he created this world, he was, uh, that some of the, they didn't really know what he was all about. You know, all his angels was doing different jobs, and they had their conceptions of what it was going to be like. And they start building this big throne up on the mountain for God. And God said, oh, no, I want to be that obvious in this thing. Well, he said, we thought that since you did all this, it should be yours. You should be. He said, no, I don't want to be that obvious in it. He said, oh, he said, I would like to be where I couldn't be seen. So they decided to, well, we'll put him on the ocean. And they started building the thing down the ocean. And he said, oh, no, I don't want to be down there. He said, man, I'll get down there. He'll find everything. Eventually, he's going to get down there. They said, well, where do you want to be? What, where, do you, where are you going to be in this world, God? Where can we put you? He said, oh. He said, I think I'll just be inside of every man. He will never look back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So God is within us. And right within us, whatever our concept is, Whatever our conception, it don't have to be big, it don't have to be like David's, it don't have to be that pretty, but whatever we as individuals, that is the only way that we're going to contact God is that thing within us. Amen. So this is where we begin. We make a decision to turn it over, and it's small, it's inadequate, and it's weak. And we never have used it because we've been traveling on self. But we just make the decision to turn it over to that, whatever it is, and then we're going to go to work. 
to clear away the things that block us off from this and make this thing grow into something that can direct our lives. So step three is just a decision. It's the first, it's the beginning. It, in fact, step three comes, a decision comes before, really, the beginning. Or really, to me, it's step four. Because step four says, step three says, this is, this is just a, this a decision. Say, if honestly and taken, sometimes it's effect, sometimes a great one is felt at once. But in most cases, there is no great sensation from uh, making a decision. He said, next we have to launch on a vigorous course of action. Yeah. And to identify the things that block us off. We got to get down to the things that block us off from God. If we want God to direct our lives, it's taking a lot of work. So the next steps, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, is carrying out the decision in step three. The decision is just the beginning. You know, a lot of times the per people, I hear people say, well, I come to, to AA and I had a lot of problems because I determined my will in my life for care of God five years ago and I'm having trouble. What's the matter? I said, well, what if... What, when I took the third step, I said, well, you didn't turn your will on you. You made a decision to do that. And the chances are reading really in trouble is they haven't done anything since they made that decision. You know I mean? It's just like going down to the bank and making a decision to save some money. You, you go down there and you make a decision to save some money and open up a bank account. And don't go back down there in five years and see how much money you got. <laughs> you just made a decision. <laughs> you know, it's, it's put going down there every week, taking that action to carry out that decision. This is what really is all about. But step three is just the beginning. And we have made this decision. So now in step four, we're going to identify the thing that block us off from God. And God is within us. And so obviously we're blocked off from him because it's not, it's not a viable force in our lives. It's not, it's not working, but it's there. It's within every individual. But there's something that blocks us from God. So step four is uh, to identify these things so that we can get to work on this decision. Remember we said he wanted them to direct it. So we got to get down and identify these things and in step five, we're gonna talk them out with someone else. In step six, we're gonna become willing to let go of them. And in step seven, we're gonna ask God to remove those things. And then that decision is going to be, that direction is, is gonna be able to, to come in. We'll be able to, God will be able to start directing our lives. Carrying out the, and the decision will begin to grow. And for the rest of our lives that we can intensify this as we repractice these, these action steps. You know, getting closer and closer to God's directions in our lives. But step three is just the beginning. It's the decision, it's the turning point. Next week, we'll go into step four, in which we'll begin to identify the things that, that block us from this decision. Next week, we'll go into step four.